This man survived a bombing in the Middle East, got punched in the face by Michael Jordan, is a more efficient three-point shooter than Steph Curry, and he hit one of the biggest shots in finals history. This man is Steve Kerr, the Lord of the Rings. With nine NBA championships, only five people in NBA history have won more titles than the Warriors head coach. But is he really one of the greatest winners ever? Or was he just lucky to be surrounded by world-class talent? How good was Steve Kerr actually? Compared to every other NBA player of his era, Steve Kerr had a highly unusual childhood. His father, Malcolm Kerr, was a professor at UCLA, specializing in Middle Eastern politics. But because he was also teaching at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, the Kerr family spent their time between California and the Middle East. However, for two years, Steve also lived in Egypt. One year, he was schooled in France, and he spent his summers touring around Europe in a family Volkswagen van. But wherever he was, the only constant thing in Steve's life was sports, and he was obsessed with baseball and basketball. Although it wasn't easy to watch him play, and it's not because he wasn't talented. Steve was good, with excellent hand-eye coordination, but he was also a spoiled brat. As soon as something went wrong, he'd yell and argue. And we can sometimes see a glimpse of that temper when he's on the Warriors bench. Thankfully, as he grew older, Steve started to calm down. And yet, one thing remained the same. It was the driveway in front of his house, with a basketball hoop bolted to the roof above the garage, where Steve spent countless hours practicing. And it all paid off. Despite being fairly skinny and unathletic with a modest six foot three height, Steve could shoot lights out. And because of his shooting, he received a scholarship to the University of Arizona under the legendary coach Lute Olson. Then, in that summer of 1983, after he graduated high school and before he became a Wildcat, Steve decided to join his family in Lebanon. His father became the president of the American University in Beirut. But there was also a civil war that had just started. Despite the political turmoil, Steve missed his family and he wanted to be with them. Because of his father's status, the Kurs had a largely stress-free summer. But right when Steve wanted to return to the States, the harsh reality of war hit him with a full blast. Just as he was preparing to board his plane, the airport was bombed. We were in the terminal, and all of a sudden there was a blast. It wasn't in the terminal, but on the runways. The whole place just froze. My mom grabbed me, and I remember running out of the terminal and through the parking lot. It was really scary. Steve. In a panic, the Kerr family ran back to their home, and Steve was stuck because all the runways were damaged. After several unsuccessful tries to board him on military planes, the university driver of his father ultimately drove him over the mountains to Syria. It was an incredibly risky trip, but Steve got away, unscathed, landing in California a few days later. When the basketball season started, Steve had a pretty unimpressive freshman year, averaging just seven points in 22 minutes on the court. But what hurt Steve more than the numbers was that his family couldn't be there to watch him play, and little did he know that his father would never see him play live. It was 3 a.m. on January 18, 1984, and Steve received the worst phone call of his life. That morning in Beirut, just like he would on any other workday, his father was walking down the hallway to his office, and then it happened. Malcolm Kerr, the president of American University in Beirut, was gunned down in his school today, the latest victim of Lebanon's seemingly endless violence. Malcolm Kerr was shot twice in the back of his head. It was a huge shocked me. Even given the situation in Beirut, I knew how dangerous it was. While all his family attended his father's funeral, Steve decided to stay in Arizona. Even more surprisingly, just two days after Malcolm got assassinated, Steve played in a basketball game. This sounds bad. The basketball wasn't more important, but the logistics were tricky, and it was cathartic for me to just play. The only time I didn't think about my father was on the court. The whole game, I was thinking of my dad, and uh, I had, I had dedicated the game to him um, privately. And not only did Steve play, he had the best game of his career. After a painful minute of silence in honor of his father, Kerr stepped onto the court and hit his first shot, finishing 5 for 7 from the field in a surprise win over arch rival Arizona State. In the next two seasons, Kerr's numbers improved drastically, and in 1986, his junior season, Steve was averaging 14 points, 4 assists, on a phenomenal 57% shooting and 90% from the free throw line. His competitiveness and shooting stroke earned him an invite to the 1986 World Cup, where Team USA won gold. Steve was the fourth leading scorer on that team, behind David Robinson, Kenny Smith, and Charles Smith. Before the 1987 NCAA season, Kerr tore his ACL, 
which could have been the end of his basketball dreams. But Steve recovered in time for the 1988 season and was playing better than ever, putting up a shooting clinic night after night. While Kerr was injured, the NCAA introduced the three-point line. And in his first season with the three-pointer, Steve immediately set the NCAA single-season record for three-point percentage, with 57.3%, hitting 114 threes, a total record that wouldn't be broken for two decades. However, during that same season, Kerr suffered the toughest moment of his career. During pregame warm-ups against Arizona State, Kerr was taunted by Sun Devils fans with chants that included, Where's Your Father? and PLO, which was the acronym for the political activist that killed Malcolm Kerr. There were about 10 or 12 uh, students yelling, you know, where's your father? Steve broke down and burst into tears. But then he picked himself up, and that anger that he played with throughout his childhood came to the surface. I rarely have a vindictive thought in my mind when I'm playing basketball, but that was probably the, the one game where I did, and uh, I've, I've never seen anything like it. Kerr played like he was possessed, scoring 20 points in the first half and making all six of his three-point attempts in a blowout win. Later that season, Steve helped the Wildcats reach the first Final Four in school history, after which he declared for the NBA draft. When he was finishing high school, making the NBA was far-fetched for Kerr, as he barely even made it to college. I was just hoping to play college ball somewhere. There's no way we ever imagined that I, I would be playing in the NBA. But through hard work and impeccable shooting, Steve was good enough that the Suns picked him up in the second round, with the 50th overall pick. I'm not an overly spiritual person, but sometimes I think maybe he's pulling a few strings up there, and that's why I ended up making it. But because he was physically inferior to almost every other player in the league, Steve spent his rookie season glued to the bench, scoring just 54 points for the entire season. However, Steve was a fighter, and when he got traded to the Cavs the next season and finally got some more playing time, he used his opportunity to the fullest. Despite his physical shortcomings, Steve was still a sniper from the outside. Kerr led the NBA in three-point percentage, making an unbelievable 51% of his threes. Steve would spend three years in Cleveland, and his 47% from deep is still the Cavs franchise record. After a short stint with rookie Shaq in Orlando, Steve reached the biggest turning point of his career, signing for the Chicago Bulls for a minimum of $150,000 per season. Despite the small salary, Kerr got a unique opportunity to play alongside one of the greatest basketball players in history and absorb the knowledge of one of the best coaches in history. Over the next five years, Kerr would prove to be one of the steadiest role players in the NBA, with 378 consecutive games played for the Bulls, during which he set several NBA records. In 1995, Kerr became the first player in NBA history who shot over 50% from the field and 50% from three. However, the Bulls lost to the Magic in the second round, and Jordan was pissed. So Michael spent the whole summer pumping iron and playing pickup on the set of Space Jam. By the time he went back to the Bulls training camp in September, Jordan was in the best shape of his life. By the time camp started, he was in incredible shape, but he was also like frothing at the mouth. More importantly, MJ wanted the same from his teammates and demanded perfection in practice. So every day at training camp was just a war. Every day was a battle and um, he talked a lot of shit. One day, Phil Jackson put Kerr up to guard Michael, and MJ immediately started trash-talking Steve, pushing him around in the post. I have a lot of patience as a human being, but uh, I tend to snap at some point because I'm extremely competitive too. I'm going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight. But even though he was five inches shorter and 40 pounds lighter, Steve was as competitive as hell, and he wasn't going to back down. So he pushed Michael back. And unlike Draymond Green and Jordan Poole, Steve and Michael's relationship improved after a punch at practice. Jordan apologized to Steve. I called Steve and I apologized. Hey, look, man, it had nothing to do with you. And Kerr earned MJ's trust and respect. It was probably, in a weird way, uh, best, the best thing that I ever did was stand up for myself with him. Because now Michael knew that Steve wasn't going to back down from anybody. He earned my respect, you know, because he, you know, he wasn't willing to back down to be a pawn in this whole process. The 1995-96 season went down in history books, with the Bulls going 72-10 and in the regular season, and then 15-3 and in the playoffs to win Chicago's fourth NBA title. Kerr had a great impact on the team that many believe to be the best team of all time. In 22 short minutes on the court, Steve averaged 8.4 points and 2.3 assists per game, which frankly doesn't sound like much. 
unless you know how insanely efficient he was. Steve shot 50% from the field, 51% from three, and 93% on free throws, becoming the first and only player in NBA history with a 50-50-90 season. In 1997, it was much of the same. The Bulls were winning, and Steve was one of the best shooters in the NBA, with 53-46-80 shooting splits. Kerr also won the three-point contest at the 1997 NBA All-Star Weekend. Chicago steamrolled through the Eastern Conference, losing just two games on their way to another NBA Finals. But in the Finals, the Utah Jazz, with Malone and Stockton, proved to be the toughest challenge they had faced that year. After four games, the series was tied, and both teams had to work extremely hard for every bucket. The Bulls then won Game 5, but in the last minute of Game 6, the score was tied at 86-86, after which came the most iconic moment of Steve Kerr's career. He mumbled something like, Steve, Steve, be ready. He comes up, I'll be ready. And then I'm like yelling back, like, I'll be ready, I'll be ready. And he hit one of the biggest shots in finals history. The Bulls won their fifth title. Tonight, Steve Kerr earned his wings. And I'm very happy for Steve. And in 1998, the last dance season, Chicago completed their second three-peat. During his tenure with the Bulls, Kerr averaged 8.2 points per game on 63% true shooting percentage, 5% better than Jordan. Kerr's impact on the court for the Bulls extended beyond the basketball court. Because of his calm and collected personality, dry humor, and professionalism, Kerr was one of the most likable teammates and a great glue guy. But after the 1998 season, the Bulls' championship core all left Chicago. Kerr ended up in San Antonio, which was the best possible career move. After five years under Phil Jackson, Steve was now playing for Greg Popovich, sharing the court with Tim Duncan and David Robinson. Now a 33-year-old, Kerr played just 16 minutes per game, averaging 4.4 points for the Spurs. But in 1999, San Antonio was by far the best team in the NBA and they dominantly won the title, losing just two games in the playoffs. Kerr became the first player since the 1960 Celtics to win four rings in a row. Steve would spend two more years with the Spurs before moving to Portland in 2001, when he joined the infamous Jail Blazers. After the 2002 season, in which he didn't play much for the Blazers, Steve was pondering retirement. But after a talk with Coach Pop, he decided to return to San Antonio for his final season. A 37-year-old Kerr played very little, and before Game 6 of the West Eastern Conference Finals, he logged just 13 minutes in 17 games. And then, in Game 6, the Spurs were losing the game by 15 points with 344 remaining in the third quarter. Their energy was terrible, their offense was stale, and Coach Pop was getting desperate. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Pop decided to put in Steve Kerr, who miraculously stole the show in Dallas. Steve nailed all four of his three-point attempts, dished out three assists, and grabbed two rebounds in his 13 minutes to send the Mavericks on an early vacation. In the finals against the Nets, Steve played just 19 minutes in the series and took just four shots. But being who he is, Kerr made three of them. The Spurs won the 2003 title thanks to the monstrous play of Tim Duncan, but Steve once again proved that you can always count on him to knock down shots when it's most important. Kerr retired with five rings and the NBA record in three-point percentage, which still stands today. As a player, he had the luck to be around some great teammates. But Steve was always a consummate professional, one of the best role players ever, and one of the most efficient NBA players of all time. If he played in today's three-point shooting era, Kerr could easily average 20 points per game. And after his playing career, Steve stayed in basketball and he did almost every possible job around the NBA sidelines. Steve first worked as a commentator on TNT for one year, sitting alongside commentating legend Marv Albert. Then he became part owner of the Phoenix Suns, starting as a consultant and eventually becoming the general manager. After the team with Steve Nash and Amari failed to win the title, Steve returned to commentating on TNT for four years, and then all of his kids went to college. Liberated from the everyday family duty, a devoted family man, Steve finally acted on his long-lasting wish to become an NBA head coach. Because of his experience in every facet of the game, excellent rapport with people, and a bright basketball mind that was mentored by Lute Olson, Bill Jackson, and Greg Popovich, Kerr immediately had two offers on the table. Thankfully, he rejected Phil Jackson and the Knicks and decided to join the Warriors. As the Golden State head coach, Kerr created another dynasty, and with his players, completely changed how basketball was played.
Kerr continued to win and break records, including four titles, a record 73-win season, and a 71% win percentage in the playoffs, another NBA record. As a player, only 13 people won more NBA championships than Steve, and only five people have more rings than him overall, making Steve Kerr one of the greatest winners in basketball history. And if you want to hear more about NBA legends, keep watching nonstop.